Uh, take out your Bibles. Uh, if you are new and you don't have a Bible or a phone to watch or to, to look on, uh, we've got Bibles. The ushers will have them. Uh, Jason right there is one of our crossfitting ushers and will... He, he, he really is. He is a crossfitting usher. Um, if you don't have a Bible, take it home. It's yours. Uh, any Star Wars fans out there? So do you know who um, uh, Sean Levy is? Anyone know the connection? Do you? Okay. Do you know what's next? Do you know why I would mention those together? He is directing the next unnamed Star Wars movie. Dang. Okay. Nice job. Um, okay. That's good. That's true. Uh, if um, Marvel, any Marvel fans... Okay, so he's also the director of Deadpool Wolverine, uh, Stranger Things fans. Okay, he also directed that. And then lesser known of Sean Levy's works, uh, Night at the Museum series. Oh, okay. Uh, and also the movie you know, Date Night by, with Steve Carell and Tina Fey. So this is where I come in. Um, so many years ago, 15-something years ago, um, I was in New York and uh, on a trip with about, I don't know, five other friends, and we were in Times Square one night doing whatever we were doing, just hanging out, seeing the sights, and there was this big film shoot going on, and it was this, and we walk up, and there's lights and all this stuff, and it's in Times Square, so you can just walk around, and it was Tina Fey and Steve Carell, and they were finishing whatever they were doing. And so um, a couple of us, another guy named Steve and I, we said, uh, so the whole group starts walking away to wherever they're going to go. We, go we, we said, we should just go with them. And so we just start walking with him. And our other three friends said, we're not going. Like, what are you guys doing? We're like, come on, come on, come on. Who would have gone with me? My people. Who would never do that? That's good. I know, Jen. Um, so we are walking with him, and we're just talking. And we don't know what we're doing. But we end up going into, um, I guess they had rented out the Times Square Applebee's, which is like the size of a football field. And the whole crew is in there. And, you know, the the... All the extras are in there, and so we just go in and we just sit down, and um, we just we're sitting in the corner and we're kind of going, I wonder how this is going to work out. What should we do now? And so we just start talking to people. We told one one couple, we're like, Hey, we're not really supposed to be here. We just walked in. They're like, That's awesome. And then they they the you know the people with the headsets on start coming. Okay, you go to costume, you do this, and we're like, Oh no, what will happen now? Um, and unfortunately, there's no great ending to this because we weren't on any lists or anything. So we just stayed there for like 45 minutes. And then we ended up just leaving because we weren't really going to get in the movie because we weren't on their sheets. Um, but here's what I want to ask you. Um, what do you think we were feeling? Or if you were in our situation, what are some of the things you'd be feeling and thinking if you were sitting there for 45 minutes? Just some of the things. Go ahead. Obvious. Hungry? Hungry? No. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> Nervous. I'm going to get in trouble. I don't know what's going to happen next. All that stuff, right? Um, Steve Levy has four daughters. What do you think his daughters, which he actually has family-friendly sets, he brings his daughters onto the sets. When they're there, what do you think they're thinking? I'm in. I'm in. Anything else? Like, do you think they're worried about anything? Do you think that they feel special? Yeah. Yeah, is there ever, do they worry about any problems? No. They're just having fun, right? Um, that is a silly but actually more poignant than you would think example of some of the things we're going to go over today as we talk about what does it mean to be a son or daughter of the king? How does that change what we're doing here and now? How, how is, you know, if you're in the room and you're not a follower of Christ, if you're online, you're not a follower of Christ, like, I want you to know, we believe and we try to live out the fact that there's a difference when, um, before I, you know, my own story is I, I had a time in my life where I wasn't following Jesus and I started following Jesus. Day-to-day -day life hit me differently after I became a Christian. It should be that way. I, should not, I shouldn't process life the same way. I should feel different in the space. And that's the reality, and some of that is what we're going to talk about today. So turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, we're actually continuing our series on the Holy Spirit. Um, and Paul mentions the Spirit's role, one of the many, but specifically in this area of our life. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, um, Paul writes this. And Paul, just, just remember, he's writing letters to churches to help them understand how to follow Jesus. It's not more complicated than that. It was new to everybody. Maybe it's new to you this morning then we can take these letters the same way. They would have had the letter. Somebody would have read it out loud for the group, so they would have been listening, going, oh, we got a letter from Paul. What did he say? He's just trying to encourage them in their new identity. We need that on day one, and we need that on day some thousand whatever. Like, we, we need this encouragement. So he says this, um, and you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, 
When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. So, um, section one of what we're going to talk about today is I want us to hear God's voice saying, you're mine. You're mine. Um, he says that, and can we uh, put, a few, yeah, there you go. Um, when he says you're marked with a seal, um, you're God's possession. Those are statements of, in the most beautiful possible way, ownership of fatherhood, of sonship, daughtership that we receive. And we're going to talk about what it means to be, what does it mean for, for us to be sealed? What does it mean to be God's possession? Um, and I want to start with the seal. So uh, if you're a crafty person, if you go to papyrus places, the wax seal that you put a metal thing in and it goes on an envelope, everybody know what that is, like the seal of whatever. So that would have been really, really familiar with them back then. Um, leaders, specifically kings, they would use their signet ring, like the metal part of that, and we could put those pictures up there. The stuff like this, or a stamp, a seal, and put it into the wax so that whatever was being delivered, specifically maybe an envelope, that when someone received it, they knew this is authentically from the king and the contents are his. That's it. That's what it meant. And if it was broken, okay, we don't know what's going on. But if it was sealed, hey, authentic, and this is from the king, these are his. And so Paul's using that language on purpose. Literally, they would have had this in their mind. He's like, you were marked with a seal. The Holy Spirit indwelling you, that is the seal. That is the promise. That's, and so... We talked about this a few weeks ago, but as we continue to think about the seal, um, go back to Ephesians 1 if you can. When does that happen according to this verse? Like when, when do we get marked? Like when does the stamp happen? When? What, is it, what does he say? When you believed. When you believed what? In the gospel. So that happens when you believe. And your belief is, you know, it's not just... I, be, I believe that to be true knowledge. You know, it's, it's the belief dropped into my heart. I'm doing this thing. Like, when you believed, not when you got better church attendance, not when you finished reading the Bible for the first time, not when you got your life cleaned up, not when you did less sins than you did before, not when you did more good deeds than when you did before. It has zero to do with that. That is the continual narrative of Scripture that it requires nothing of us other than, God, take my heart. That is it. Don't ever forget that, especially on the days where you're like, I don't deserve it today. You never deserved it. You won't tomorrow. And when the enemy is trying to chirp in your ear going, you don't deserve this, we can just go, totally, that's why Jesus is here. Thanks, like, move, move on. His voice doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, so when you believe the gospel, so what's the go what does the word gospel mean for some of you guys who have been churchy people for a while? What does it mean? It means the good news. And so if you're new to church, some of this stuff just isn't as complicated as you think. It just means good news, the good news of Jesus. There are a few sentences we can go, well, this is the gospel. Something that's this great of news, um, I would love to talk for seven weeks about it. Like, there's more to the good news than just, I believe a thing, whatever. But in general, it's the saving work of Jesus' life and death, his death on the cross where he took our sins on himself. He died and received punishment, so we did not have to face the consequence of our sin. He rises three days later taking, um, literally, um, opening the door of, of life and death on our behalf, receiving, uh, giving us eternal life forever. Uh, he appeared to, um, you know, up to 500 people after he raised from the grave, defeating death on our behalf. And he said, I'm coming back so you can be with me again. And that's just the beginning. Like, it's the beginning because the gospel is also the living out of the Christian church. That's the gospel in motion. So it's, it's not just one thing. It's seven sides of a 20-sided coin. The gospel is the good news that Jesus has saved the world. The kingdom of God is here and it's advancing and one day it'll be completed on and on and on. So when you believe that, right, you were marked with a seal. So that seal, here's a, a helpful quote from, for me at least that about, okay, how does that translate even, even better to our life? So we said this, but seals were used widely in the ancient world as the primary way of indicating ownership. They were typically made of hard stones or precious metals and had a distinctive image engraved on them, usually the representation of a favorite deity, a hero, or a portrait. Um, all of a person's significant possessions were marked with the impression of the seal. Even slaves and livestock were actually marked by the owner in this way. In some cases, people declared themselves the possession of a deity by the imprint of a seal. 
The one true God also marked his possessions by means of a seal, yet his seal does not have a physical impression. He's given his people the gift of the Holy Spirit as the sign of their belonging to him. Um, he could have just done it with words. Um, he could have declared it. He could have said it, and that would have been true. When he says something, it's just true. Um, I don't know that we can ever... I know that while we're here, we can never fully grasp what it means that God said, the way I'm going to mark you is through a sacrifice and through an indwelling and through a humbling, and I'm actually going to come and live in you. And be like, I don't know that we can quite grasp how different that is than a stamp. Um, and he says, and yet this is how you're marked. You're special. You're set apart. You're different. Um, so we're marked with a seal. Next, um, God's possession. Um, Let's look at Romans 8. If you're ever wondering or wavering in your identity in Christ, read Romans chapter 8. And, and read lots more, but that's, that's one. And read Ephesians chapter 3, Romans chapter 8. Um, Paul's really clear about reminding us who we are. So this is just part of it. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship and daughtership. By him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're God's children. So this idea of being God's possession, um, it's so much greater, it's so much different than um, these things over here are mine, and I keep them in, like, it's, it's, it's the way I would talk about Maddie and Grant, like, that's my boy, that's my girl, that's my daughter, like, it's, it's that kind of thing, like, I'm with them, they're with me, like, it's that kind of language, and so... Paul writes this crazy mystery that the Spirit cries out, Abba, Father, on our behalf. When we forget, when we remember, somehow the Spirit is reminding us by using that phrase, Abba, which is our equivalent of daddy or papa, mama. Like that, that's our equivalent. It's, that, it's little kid language. The same word that Jesus uses when he says, hey, I want you to pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, the, the famous prayer we know. It's Abba in heaven. Like he, Jesus invites us to address God the Father, not as Yes, sir, I'm here. No, 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 I want you to talk to him like this. Talk to him like a six-year-old. Daddy, Papa, like what are we doing today? And it, if that seems really foreign to you, as it does sometimes for me, we've got so much more to go. We've got so much more to learn. So much more. It doesn't mean that we're wrong. It doesn't mean like, why don't you get it? It just means, oh my gosh, there's intimate language and intimate living ahead for you in this way. Um, how do I do the possession thing more? Um... Jason, could you come over here? Um, when I, so we just went and saw, and you can just, you can just stand right there. That's great. Uh, we just saw our son, Grant. Um, he's on the East Coast for the summer. And would someone say, hey, is Grant yours? Yep, that's my boy. But how do I treat him as mine? Um, when I first see him and I see him, well, and, and then when I'm leaving, this is how it goes. It's, and it's, and I'm hugging him way longer than he wants. And I just hold him here and it's like, I love you, buddy. I love you. But I kiss him. He doesn't want it. He's 21. And I hold him. And then when I'm leaving, I say, I love you so much. We're really enjoying this. You're ruining the moment. You're totally ruining the moment. Um, but I tell him, the first thing I say and the last thing I say, I love you. I am so proud of you. I'm going to miss you so much. In those moments, thank you, Jason. I, you are loved. But in those moments... When I'm letting him know who he is to me, it's not complicated. Like, I haven't seen you in a while. This is what I want you to know. I love you. You're my boy. And I'm leaving. Don't forget this when I leave. Like, it's not this. That's what Grant being mine looks like. Do you see the difference? Like, when he said, you're God's possession, it's this, we mess it up in our world of what possession means. Like, it's, um, it's just joy. It's the prodigal son getting run to by the father. Um, he doesn't go into a speech of like, why were you gone so long? All this stuff. It's just, um, I don't know who needs to hear today that he doesn't take less time in that moment because you've been away for a while or something. Like he might hug you longer. You're still his. You can't disqualify yourself. Who needs to hear that? Like he loves you so much. Um, and just like at the beginning, we can't earn it. You can't earn your way back. It's just come back. Who's coming back today? Like, who needs that? So pay attention. Pay attention. He's speaking. Um, 
So that first section is, is, could we hear God's voice saying, you're mine? Not like, but you're mine, you're mine, you're mine. Um, and secondly, um, my, the, when he says deposit guaranteeing an inheritance, the way I'm translating that is God's voice saying, our future is secure. Not your future is secure. God's saying to you, our future is secure. That is very, very different. Hey, I've taken a care of your future is secure. No, he would go, Jason, like, our future is, like, you and me, our future is secure. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. You are part of the joy. Like, he thought about us in the future. Like, I'm doing this for us. Our future is secure. So when we talk about deposit, guaranteeing, and inheritance, he's like, I had us in, I had we in mind. Like, it's, I'm not going to set something up and spin the wheel and go, like, this is us. I want to be with you. I died so I can reconcile us together, so I can put us back together again. The world was broken, and you were broken, and we were broken, and I died so it could be together again. So our future, and you receiving the Holy Spirit is a de deposit guaranteeing that future. So when the Holy Spirit enters into your life, just know that that's just a foretaste of what's to come. It's just this much. We know what deposit is, right? Like a de and, 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 and Catherine said it this week in our preaching team. Our view of deposit and the, the, the security and the, um, the fact that we can count on that is totally tainted because we're humans. And deposit means, well, I can probably count on it, but there's going to be a lawsuit. And it's like, this is God's world. He doesn't break promises. So when he says deposit, guaranteeing, it means like it is for sure going to happen. So um, when we think about deposits, what do we think about? What does that mean? Where, where do we do that? Banks, houses, like I put this down, that's mine. An example I thought, again, we were, the reason we were seeing Grant, our, our son, uh, for the past couple days, we have musical theater kids. He's in a show back east, so we went to see it. And uh, I went, and my wife and my mom, who got on a plane for the first time in 30 years, <laughs> destroyed it. She owned it, and she went in the window the second time. And she's like, I'll go in the window. She was just a warrior. Um, and then Grant's girlfriend, Abby. So we came, we saw the show twice. The first night, everybody had tickets. We had a great time. It was fun. But then the second time we saw the show, um, only Jen, my mom, and I had tickets, but his girlfriend, Abby, didn't have a ticket yet because it was sold out. So our experience leading up to the play, especially that last hour, was really, really different, right? There we go, yeah. So for the three of us, we were wandering around, like concessions, like talking to people, doing whatever we're doing. But Abby came about 45 minutes early, and she's just standing next to the door because she doesn't know if she's going to get in. She's not sure what the future holds. She has no deposit. She doesn't know what's going on. She has no seat. The three of us go, there's our seats. We can go back outside and use the restroom. Nobody's going to take our seats. We have a seat at the table. She has nothing. Now she eventually got in. Yay. Um, but do you see the difference in that experience? Paul is saying, live differently now because you got a seat at the table. If you have a seat at the table, this stuff just doesn't mean the same thing as it used to. The world gets put in its proper place if you go, well, no, this is important and it's good and stuff, but this isn't the main thing. The main thing's on the way, right? Okay. Um, okay, another helpful quote. I need him. Uh, this word, the word that we're talking about for deposit, is borrowed from the commercial world and means a deposit or first installment on a, uh, in higher purchase. It's a token payment assuring the vendor that the full amount will eventually follow. At the end of the age, God will redeem his pledge and open the treasuries of heaven to all who are in Christ. Meanwhile, the Spirit gives us the assurance that these things one day will be ours. Um, did you know that's actually written down? The book of Revelation says your name is written in the book of life. Your, your reservation is written down. Does that mean there's an actual book? I don't know. It could be metaphor or whatever, but God wanted us to know, I got your name down. I'm waiting on you. Like, or whatever, right? So it's assured. Inheritance. So it's a deposit guaranteeing what? Our inheritance. As adopted sons and daughters, we get the full inheritance that was given to Jesus, and now we are engrafted in. He says, now it's yours too. What is our inheritance? Say some words. Eternal life. That's pretty good. Do you guys like that? Eternal life? Okay. Um, what else? What, what's our inheritance? So we get to live forever uh, here? What I mean, we'll tell, say more. Kingdom of God, that's our inheritance. Jenny, did you say something? With him, yeah. Um, part of our inheritance, Mark says, in Revelation, says there's no, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain. That's a pretty good deal. Um, 
there's no way that our minds can grasp what's in store. We just get these little hints, these little pin, pinholes that go like, it's kind of like this. Um, the idea of inheritance coming to us, uh, heaven is part of that, and it is okay to go, I'm just glad about eternal life. I'm really glad about that. That's okay, but it's, it's not all of it, but it's some of it. And it seemed important enough to Jesus and Paul to put that out in front of the disciples. So Jesus, in one of the last conversations he had with his disciples in John chapter 14, he said he could tell they were nervous by what he was saying because he was talking about his crucifixion. And he says, um, you believe in my father, also believe in me. And he says, I'm going ahead to prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many rooms. What is he talking about? What's that mean? Come on, you know the answer. It's easy. Heaven, and when he says there's many rooms, what's he trying to communicate? There's room for everybody. I'm, he's literally going, in heaven, there's room for everybody. He says, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. We are talking about the Jesus that John writes and says, without Jesus, nothing has been made, nothing was made that has been made. He created the entire world. Every atom, every planet, everything like, and he says, I'm going ahead to prepare a place for you. I'm the one that can do that. I can create this world that you love and know and flourish in. And I'm going ahead to prepare a place for you. And I know you infinitely. All the things you like and don't like, I know that more than you do. And so I have you in mind. I have you in mind. I have you in mind. I'm going ahead to prepare a place. And then he says, if that weren't true, would I have told you that I'm coming back to get you and take you to be with me where I am? How clear is he with his disciples? He's trying to calm their hearts going, there's a bunch of stuff gonna go down. I'm gonna die, everybody's gonna scatter. In this world, you'll have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. But don't forget, your future is secure. Our future is secure. I've taken care of it, and it's gonna be awesome. The Bible also says, no mind has, um, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. So when we try to imagine what it's like, just know it's not gonna be us sitting on a cloud. Like, that's not, I don't want to do that. Do you want to do that? That sounds so boring. Like, I'm going to play a harp or like there's, you know, little winged babies flying around. That sounds like awful. <laughs> it won't be like that. Like, seriously, you guys, like he's, Jesus would go, I don't want to do that either. Like, there's more than we can ask or imagine. That's part of our inheritance. But the weird thing we talk about heaven, heaven actually starts now for a Christian. So Dallas Willard, one of the best Christian thinkers, pastors ever, said, well, eternal life for a Christian starts while, we're st while we are still alive. Okay, what? Um, how does heaven come and invade earth now? Well, all those things that are coming, we get little glimpses through the power of the Holy Spirit here and now. That idea of no more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears, that can happen physically. When someone's physically healed, the Holy Spirit still does that. It's like, it's a little glimpse of going, oh, one day everybody's gonna be healed. Like that, okay. No more sorrow, no more pain. When, rate, when, when um, reconciliation happens between two people or you supernaturally are able to forgive, all those things even emotionally are, are signs of what's actually to come. That's part of our inheritance. You mean, I don't have to have that pain in my heart anymore? I don't have to regret like that anymore? I don't have to feel sorry for what I did to that person? Like, really? No, you'll, like, the, the wellness of forgiveness will envelop you and you'll no longer feel guilt and shame anymore. Like all of these things, Right? And not only that, um, Paul says we get new bodies. Like, that's actually, Scripture's that plain. If you've never read it, Paul goes, yeah, you get a new body. I don't know about you, but I'm 50. This will not work for eternity. <laughs> not going to work. But, but uh, honestly, like, if you're a logic person going, this, this isn't designed for eternity, so something else better happen. Seriously, or I'm just going to be sitting in a corner the whole time. But Paul says this. He goes mystery further. He's like, you can't, basically, you can't imagine what your new body is going to be like. Because he goes, it's kind of like this. You know how a little seed becomes like this giant, beautiful rose bush? It'll be like that with your body. And your body now is that little seed. You can't imagine what it'll be like. Does that mean I'm gonna have wings and fly? Like, guys, I don't know. We don't know and we're not told because we probably couldn't imagine it. But it'll be better. It'll be different. And that's part of our inheritance going, wow, all those things inform my life right now. Okay. However, the best part of our inheritance in the future and now, and somebody said it earlier, I think it was Jenny, um, is Jesus. And yes, that's the bumper sticker, but it's, it's more than, you guys, um, that deep longing within all of our hearts that we are either experiencing or have experienced. 
that idea of going, there is more. I know there's more. I don't feel complete. I don't feel satisfied. I, you know, whatever it means to go, there, there's got to be more to this life. That will one day be put all the way back together, even for a Christian, because we still experience those things going, man, Jesus has, he's shown me what, it like, what it's like to live with him, but there's still this longing for more. One day we will see Jesus with unveiled faces and that idea of going, I am now fully reconciled to God. My heart and his heart are fully together. That's what shalom means. That word shalom means peace. It's not like shalom, like I'm blessing you with no conflict today. It's shalom, I'm blessing you. May you be whole in God. Like may you experience some of that wholeness that is yet to come. But then now, well, what's Jesus, what's the reward now? Because clearly Paul and Jesus have this, this different ordering of life because of this. They, they see and experience this world here and now differently because of these concepts of what's to come. And Jesus is the part of the reward in that too. Um, we, we know this, but if you don't, when you become a Christian, it doesn't mean every, that eternity starts now and everything's cool. Sometimes it gets worse. But Jesus promised part of heaven is like, I'm going to be with you in that stuff in a way that I wasn't before you accepted and followed me. Um, the nearness you feel to me in tough times is going to be different. Your perspective on those tough times and how you deal with those things, I'm going to help you in a way that you've never been helped before. So the, the Jesus piece and everything, including like, I cry during worship because he's near me. Like all of those things are part of the inheritance now. But how does it help us live differently? I'm telling you guys, like you look at Jesus and Paul. Jesus, a perfect example of how this informed Jesus' life differently in the here and now is John 13. Again, some of those last moments he was having with his disciples. Last Supper, John writes very clearly um, before Jesus washes their feet. It said, Jesus knew where he had come from and he knew where he was going. Therefore, he got up, wrapped a towel, went around his waist and washed their feet. Somehow John is connecting Jesus' identity to his ability to get down and do a slave's job that would have been embarrassing. He knew where he had come from. I'm the father's. He knew where he was going. I'm, this isn't my home. This isn't my home. This isn't my address. And so he's, he's just not affected by the world and worldly things and worldly worries in the same way that we are. Um, there is a reordering of life that can happen and needs to continue to happen that um, has to do with like a, the, sh the bookshelves, meaning before Jesus, I had a bunch of stuff on the top of the bookshelf, the most important place that always shifted around and I never knew what was supposed to go up there, but this will make me feel better today. So this is going on the top shelf and this is going on the top shelf. There's this reordering of life when you go, I know whose I am. Those people's opinions that seem to be so important, like that doesn't go here, that doesn't go here. Like when we truly believe that God's opinion is the only one that matters, that top shelf is different. In the same way, when we go, my inheritance is coming. The worldly things I try to grab for, they come off of the top shelf because Paul himself says, I know what it means to live in plenty and in want. Through Christ, I can do all things who strengthens me. Now that can apply other places too, but he's talking about money. He's like, um, if I have a bunch or I don't have a bunch, fine. Paul also talks about his physical life that way. He's so committed to going, I'm loved by Jesus and I have a future. I'm getting a new body, whatever it is. And he's with me now. When he talks about dying, he literally, this is Chad's translation, but he goes, you know, it's so much better to be with Jesus. Like he doesn't have a death wish or anything, but he's like, if I died, awesome, because I get to be with Jesus forever. But I have some work here still to do, so I think I'll, God's probably going to have me stick around on earth for a little while longer. That's how he literally processes death, because he's so convinced that shelf has been completely rearranged for Paul because he believes this stuff. God, I want to believe it more today. I need to be reminded more today, right? How would we live differently if this stuff would just sink a little bit deeper? It's not going to make the pain go away but it's going to put the pain in its rightful place here and now, right in Jesus' arms, right in his arms, that he understands and he sees you and he empathizes. And it's going to put the pain in the right perspective and our lives here in the right perspective, our accomplishments in the right perspective in view of eternity and what's coming. We can have, when we talk about, when Advent comes around and we talk about hope, joy, peace, and love at Christmas time. Those are not fleeting things. We have a deep-seated hope. We have a deep-seated joy, a deep-seated peace because of these things that are marked in stone and sealed through the promised Holy Spirit. That's our, that's our promise. Um, the last thing I'll say is this, and band, you guys come up. Um, could
could we believe that God would say to you, yes, you, you are mine, and our future is secure. You are mine, and our future is secure. How would we live differently? Um, as we talk about a secure future, how would you view your finances differently if someone said, hey, you can have unlimited money for the rest of your life? It would change it, right? Are you guys still here? Yes, it would. Everyone go, yes, it would change it. Yes, it would. But it would change how you worried about stuff, but it would also, I think it would change how I gave. I wouldn't have a scarcity mentality. I'd be like, take it. So often I want to take my life and hold it and control it. And Jesus says, when you give up your life, you will find freedom. It is so much easier to not grip and white knuckle my life here when I go, my life is his and it's spoken for now and forever. Like, it's so much easier for me to give myself away when I realize whose I am and where I'm going. How would we live differently if we believe that our future is secure and in a deposit? How would we live differently if I truly believe God says, Chad, you are my boy. You're my boy. Thomas Chadwick Halliburton, I love you just as you are, not as you should be. And I like you. And I want to be around you. And I made you. I delight in you. I rejoice over you with singing. I know every hair on your head. If I could believe that more tomorrow, my day tomorrow is going to be different. Um, and it goes against a plague in our world. And the lies that we hear, that we've grown up with because we have broken relationships all around us. And it's no one's, no one's trying to go out and hurt people. Uh, we are hurt, and so we start hurting others, and we've had bad examples and fathers and mothers, and God's working his best to try and get us a little bit back more to center before heaven comes around. Um, I was at a, uh, our family was at a museum in San Diego a number of years back, and it was called um, Post Secret. Post Secret is the name of the exhibit. It was at the San Diego, San Diego Museum of Us, and Post Secret is something a man started, and you could put the, the image up. Post Secret is something a man started, uh, I think it was like almost 10 years ago, and he basically just said, hey, write a secret down, a secret you have, down on a postcard and send it in. Uh, now 10 years later, there's like a million that have been sent in, something like that, and so he has them displayed in different rooms at this gallery, and you walk through and you see what people's secrets are, and they don't say what their name is or anything, it's just like, here's my secret. Here's the thing I chose to write down on this postcard that I've never told anybody, and some of it's really amusing. Um, some of them that I remember are things like, uh, we met playing the video game World of Warcraft and we're not ashamed of it. Like that's their secret. <laughs> um, one of them was, uh, I, I'm a Starbucks barista and I give decaf to people who are mean. <laughs> I, I was like, oh dang, that's pretty good. But it was a bunch of amusing stuff. But the, the overwhelming majority, the thing that people have never told anyone are a, bunch, a thousand different way, ways of saying, I just want to belong. I just want to be needed. I just want to do all this. Like, that, that's the overwhelming. Like, I just want to matter. Like, this, this longing to be someone's, like, permanently. Because I've had this happen. Like, it's just grief. Grief. And I come into this one room, and I look on the wall. It was right about here. And I just start crying. And I told Jen, I go, Jen, come here, come here, come here, come here. And I come up, and all it says, the, the one thing this person chose to write down and turn in, their secret was, I just want to be somebody's favorite. It's right there in the center. I'm like, oh my gosh. And my, my immediate thought was, I wish I could talk to him. Like, I wish I could talk to that person, not because I think I have all the answers or I can talk him into it, but just going, no, no, you are. Like, you are someone's, like, do you have any idea? Has anyone ever told you about Jesus? Has everyone, anyone ever told you what he's actually like? Like from his words in the Bible, not from weird actions of Christians, but like, he, if you met him, if you ever meet him, you won't be able to get enough of him. Everybody that was around him couldn't get enough of him. All the, all the stragglers, all the people who would have written all these cards, they're the ones who couldn't get enough of him. They hung out with him. All the churchy people were mad. But I'm telling you, you would fit in with Jesus. Can I tell you about him? And so if you are here and you're saying, I know him and I feel alone. I know him and I feel separate. I know him and I don't feel special. I know him and I don't feel like he's got every hair on my head numbered. Would you have that conversation with him today? Would you let somebody pray with you? If you've never heard that for the first time, these are eternal truths that some of us are living by and it's been life transformation and life changing and it's also really hard. So I encourage you to do it with a community. We gotta have people to remind us of this stuff because we got the other message coming 24 seven. So we're gonna worship. 
um, the most important thing you can do is keep having this conversation with God. Don't end the conversation because somebody up here stops talking. This is supposed to launch you, launch us into our conversations with God. So whatever the Holy Spirit's talking to you about, whatever you feel like you're thinking about, keep doing that. Do that with you. Do that while you sing or do that and say, hey, I need somebody to pray for me. You can explain what you want or not. Like just go, hey, and there's a bunch of you that just need space and grace. You're like, I can't hear what you're saying. I'm just hurting too bad. This is a place to have space and grace too. Um, you don't have to go out and defeat the world. Maybe you feel pretty defeated and just sit here and receive. So Lord Jesus, we love you. Uh, we're gonna worship. We're gonna respond. Um, this entire universe is a response to your love. That's what it is. And so Lord, we worship you as a response to what you've done, as a response to your love. You are good and your faithful love endures forever. Holy Spirit of God, you have all authority here. You who saw fit to mark us with a seal of your presence, you have authority here. Anything and everything that would try, is trying, has tried to speak against the truth that we are beloved sons and daughters, go in Jesus' name. You're not allowed here. That's not the conversation we're having. God, we ascribe worth through our prayers, through our songs, through our hearts in Jesus' name.